GD502, Recording Space, Tools and Techniques, with Duncan Heather. Before you can make a start designing, you'll need to plot your site accurately on paper. And in order to do this, you'll need to carry out a site survey of the garden. Your measurements should be as accurate as possible, as mistakes here could land you in court being sued by your client. It's for this reason I suggest the garden designer only carries out his or her own surveys on relatively small, simple plots, up to a quarter of an acre or around about a thousand square metres. Anything larger than this, or involving complicated levels, should be carried out by a qualified land surveyor at the client's expense. Invest in a good tape measure. One that goes out to 50 or 60 metres is usually good enough for most gardens, and you can buy one of these for about £30 in most DIY stores or builders merchants. If possible, Get yourself a willing assistant. If you can't get anyone to help you, then a metal spike, skewer or temp peg that can be hooked over the end of your tape will do just as well. Before I arrive on site, I'll always do a little research on the internet. My first stop is sites like Multimap or Google Earth which will allow me to get a good aerial view of the site and the surrounding neighbourhood. It may also give me a clue as to the shape of the boundary if the photo is clear enough. Next, I'll look for sites such as ProMap or MapMart. These specialist digital mapping sites allow some countries to download street maps or even individual plots at a scale of up to 1 to 1250, which can then be used for planning applications as well as assist the designer with the manual site survey. And in some circumstances, may do away with the need to survey the site altogether if only a rough layout plan is required. When you arrive on site, the first thing to do is to walk around the garden to familiarise yourself with the plot. Be aware, gardens are rarely square or have true right angles. What looks like a straight line on paper may very well be angled or even curved, so never trust your eyes. Always measure very carefully. Next, take an A3 pad of paper and draw two separate plans. One large one of the house to include all the windows, doors, drain pipes, plus any inspection chambers or manhole covers that are close to the building. Only include the part of the house which is relevant to the garden plan, either the front or the back. Don't include it unless it's relevant to the garden plan. Then, on a separate sheet of paper, draw out a plan of the whole site, getting the shape as accurate as possible, and include the house, garage, outbuildings, and any existing trees, etc. You'll need to record each tree's approximate height, the girth of the trunk, and the canopy spread, and include trees that are overhanging from neighbouring gardens. When taking the spread, take four readings from the north, south, east and west so you can record the shape of the canopy as well as the spread. Regardless of the shape of the garden, you always want to start with the house and your house should sit square to the plan. Accurate measurements of the house are essential because you'll use the house to fix the other points on the site. 
Surveying is not complicated. In general, we're only going to use three types of measurement when surveying a garden. A direct line measurement is the simplest of all and literally does what it says on the tin. It measures from point A to point B. A running dimension is similar to a direct line measurement, except you measure a number of points along the same line. This is particularly useful when measuring the house, as you can start at one corner and run the tape along the wall and record the positions of all the doors and windows along the same line. When you know the length of three sides of a triangle, there is only one shape that triangle can be. Triangulation is using these principles to fix the corners of the garden and the position of trees. Using one wall of the house as one side of your triangle, you take another two measurements from each end of the wall to the same corner, which then gives you your three sides of a triangle. These measurements are used to accurately plot the position of all the corners of the boundary relative to the house. Start at one corner and work your way all the way round all its sides until you arrive back at where you've started. Use running dimensions and direct line measurements and assume all walls are 90 degrees unless obviously not. Record all the measurements clearly on your sketch of the house and make sure all numbers are clearly legible so there's no confusion when you get back to the office. Even if you think the garden is completely square, you should always check the corners using triangulation and never take for granted what your eye is telling you. Triangulation involves taking two measurements from fixed corners of the house to a point that you wish to plot. In this case, we'll use AB, as shown in figure one, for our fixed points. One top tip here is that the larger the triangle, the more accurate our measurement. Therefore, triangulation AF to GF will be more accurate than AE to BE because the triangle is bigger. It doesn't matter that A and G are not in a straight line. Remember that you need two measurements from the house for every corner you plot. It's very easy to forget to take one measurement and this could result in you having to drive back to the site just to take one vital measurement. I always draw out the triangulation lines on my rough sketch of the site to make sure I have all the measurements I need before I leave. It's totally unnecessary to measure the length of the fences as the triangulation will plot four points which then just need joining together. If you measured C to E, E to F and F to D and the measurements you received were not the same as your triangulation, this will only lead to confusion. So I prefer to remain ignorant and just trust in my triangulation. You can also use triangulation to plot the position of trees and other elements in the garden. When measuring a tree, you run each tape to the centre middle rather than the front of the trunk, as this will give us a more accurate reading. Triangulation can also be used to plot the corners of other outbuildings such as garages and sheds, and even the centre of drain covers. So it's probably the measurement designers use most when surveying a garden. When plotting an outbuilding, it's important to plot at least two of the corners. Once you've plotted the two corners, you can complete the rest of the sides, assuming that the angles are 90 degrees. There is one more measurement that is useful for garden designers and these are called offsets. Imagine for a moment our garden, instead of just one tree, has a small wood. 
you need two tape measures for this. Lay one along the ground between two known points, for example E and E1. If you don't have two easily identifiable points, you can make them up and then triangulate their positions, for example E1. Then, with the second tape, run a measurement back from each tree to the tape on the ground, making sure you meet the tape at 90 degrees. Then record the measurement from the tree as well as the point at which the two tapes meet. In this way, you can quickly measure many trees using a range of offsets. This method is also useful for measuring curved flower beds. Set up your tape close to your flower bed along the ground and plot the position of each end using triangulation. Then take a measurement at 90 degrees along the tape every 2 to 5 metres say back to the flower bed and record the distance. When you get back to your office all you have to do is to mark off the points on the plan and then join up the dots like a dot to dot picture to get the shape of your curve. This same approach can be even used for measuring curved boundary walls. In addition to measuring the site you will also need to carry out a full level survey but this will be covered in GD702 and more specifically in GD1114. The designer should photograph the site extensively as a reference for what already exists. Don't just take landscape shots but also reference photos of features such as steps, drains, oil and gas tanks, septic tanks, boggy areas, banks, overhead cables, shots from upstairs windows showing an aerial view of the garden and its neighbours. In short, you can't take too many photographs. These may also one day be useful as before and after pictures if the garden is ever to be published in a magazine. So don't throw them away afterwards. File them carefully for a later date. Other sources of information are also important and should be considered. In some countries the client is legally responsible for supplying the services information such as the route of electricity, water and drainage. If this is the case you'll need to inform them in writing so they're aware of their responsibilities. You may still need to obtain this information on their behalf and you would do this by contacting the service providers directly who should have a record of where the pipes and wires enter and leave the property. Different countries have different planning restrictions so it's up to the individual students to find out from your local town councils what, if any, restrictions exist. TPOs or tree preservation orders, SSSI or sites of special scientific interest, AONBs, areas of outstanding natural beauty, conservation areas, national parks, and listed buildings are to name but a few. All of these will be covered in much more detail in subsequent lectures on surveying and planning.